We've come back for more like that ex that just won't go away. You've deleted their number, blocked them on social media, but they really haven't taken the hint. A bit like Mark Flanagan and Michelle Keegan when he waited outside the Coronation Street studios for her to finish her shift at the Rover's return. I'm not interested, Mark. I've moved on. I know you're a foot and hand model and you're in the St. Helens reserves, but I've got bigger fish to fry. We're like a band that's reformed and we're never as good the second or the third time around. The police, Blondie, Destiny's Child. It's like 2016 when Axel, Slash and Duff finally buried the hatchet and reunited for a Guns mm. N' Roses stadium tour. It's been a long, dark, lonely lockdown. Lonely. But we're here to make your lives even worse. Nearly a year since our last podcast, guys. In that time, the world has gone bananas. Trump nearly got impeached again. People thought the great man, Kim Jong-un, was dead. Idiots. Elon Musk named his baby A A E. A12 Musk, Miley Cyrus, claimed that she had an experience with an alien after being chased by a UFO. There was a reverse waterfall, a reverse waterfall in Australia. A pair of gay penguins stole an egg from a lesbian penguin couple, true story, at a Dutch zoo. And Salford got to the Challenge Cup final. Out of Your League is back with a fresh episode available to download every Wednesday until John leaves the band again. Alongside me, <laughs> Weasel Dumb and Weasel D, John Wilkin and Mark Flanagan. How are you, you little buggers? Are you, well, you know what? You made a reference about exes and the, the whole opening gambit, Will, there was about exes. Well, how's your all of life? Are, are you still... Hopelessly single, Will. I mean, you, you sp speak about exes as though it's been an issue for you, but it hasn't, has it, Will? In real, <laughs> yeah, yeah. In real terms. Are you, are you reading, you're reading into it at my insecurities, John. Yeah, let's get Freud on it. Let's go straight Freud yeah. on it. What, why, Ooh, why are you bringing up exes, Will? Freud. <laughs> straight into Freud. I don't want to talk Will about Will never the love body. anybody as much as he loves himself, so he's going <laughs> to That is true. true. That is very true. lovable, though. That is true. A l very lovable. So go on, how are you two? I haven't seen you for... I actually haven't seen you. This isn't just for, for the podcast, is it? We haven't seen each other in the flesh for a long time as a, as a threesome, have we? Mark, what's going on? Um, not too much, to be honest. Uh, obviously retired from the Oval game or moved on to a different career, as I like to uh, like to call it. Um, moved house. Um, don't have a coffee shop open at the minute because of covid um, spend most days chasing John on the phone, and uh, my wife's about to have a baby in the next few weeks. So it's been congratulations, quite, uh, Mark. Quite You're busy be a dad time. again, and this one yeah. is yours, isn't it? The second I hope, one. Yeah, I, I, I hope so. Yeah, you've not been around uh, about eight months ago. You weren't you weren't in the picture, were no. you? So I think I think I'm safe. I, she can't get pregnant via Skype anyway, can she? I don't think so. Um, no, also, no, so no. John's John's not very good at answering his phone, is he? I've noticed that. We've we'll, no, we'll noticed no. it, but he knows it's this. Not, yeah. not great for business partners, is it? Well, you say that, but it's just yeah, it, well. it's like again about relationships. Well, you know, if you're both pushing full throttle on the communication terms, it doesn't work. You need one yeah. needy partner and one less so needy. Um, read into that what you will. <laughs> but Mark, you have moved house and we should announce, you know, we're not going to announce your exact postcode in your street address, but you've left mm. your working class roots in Saddleworth and you've moved to um to Altrincham. Hell. Mm. Yeah, well, my wife is from is from not far from um the urban suburbs of um Hale and Altrincham, so I was I'm doing as I'm told and I'm moving to where the the wife wants to live. Mm. It's interesting right, look, that you John, talk, talk about roots. Well, you talk about roots, Will. I'm not having you bring roots up as like an anchor to where Mark <laughs> found. What you're trying to suggest is Mark's forgotten his roots from moving out of Oldham, which absolutely he should want to move out of Oldham. Like that's you that's, know, he that's should what you, that's what John told me. He did the same yeah. thing when he moved across from from Holland from St Helens. He said, "Get me away from yeah. those hell holes and get me somewhere 100 where, you know, I, well, I, in the middle of the field in the hole. where I've only got his thoughts to think with." <laughs> Don't live in Hull. Don't live in Oldham. Live somewhere else. That's my advice. Yes. Look, honestly, how has it been then? So, for example, John, you have both retired 
in basically in the space of sort of lockdown and since we last all sort of met up and and spoke really how how have you adjusted to it all because you didn't really have a goodbye i know you're not bothered about it well you'll say you're not bothered about it but deep down you really are but that's what that's a different story and we'll get into freud later but <laughs> how has it been adjusting to life without rugby without that routine well the, the weird thing about uh the lockdown actually will i felt like if you were going to retire from rugby it was the most amazing way to do it i had probably three or four months at home you know becoming or feeling like a normal person that just got me out of the routine of you know like your life builds up to a weekend where you play a game of rugby and then there's a bit of a collapse on a monday then you build back up for a weekend well i had like four months of not doing that anywhere in the first lockdown so i really like I'm not embarrassed to say I really enjoyed that. I I didn't uh, feel, you know, guilty about behaving normally. And, and, you know, for reflect, we we had to go and set like a 5k uh, time and I was running quite a lot, but I went out on a run and I stopped halfway around and walked back. And I was like, there's not a chance I'm playing rugby again. No way. I don't want to do it. I, I like emotionally, mentally, all of it was done. And, um, it was the lockdown that made that happen. It was just the first time for 16, 17 years that you've pressed pause on on part of your life. And I think what a beautiful thing that this lockdown's done has made everybody press pause, like on elements of the life and stop and think. And, you know, it, it was coming to the end anyway. Look, I'm, I'm not stupid. I was like far from the best version of myself in a rugby sense. But that pause just allowed me to just think differently about like the world of my life. And, and like you become conditioned to be in a certain environment. I became conditioned to be part of a rugby team to some extent, but nothing's permanent. You can change that mindset really quickly. And I, and I felt like, you know, I managed to do that really quite quickly from the point at which I decided I wasn't going to play again. And uh, the interesting thing would have been if Toronto had a kept playing, would I have carried on playing, you know? And there might have been a different pressure then. It's It was easy for me to just pull the pin when I knew that they weren't going to play again this year. But yeah, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed the lockdown. It made it a nice transition for me out of the game. Mark, you had a different uh, experience really, didn't you? Because obviously, you know, you had the Challenge Cup final and I know there were no fans in that sense, but you, you had a sort of chance to say goodbye and you played... Look, we always we always mentioned Wakefield. It was just written in the stars. Wakefield was your last game. It wasn't quite Wakefield away. It was in the calendar, but it was at Headingley, wasn't it? And you got, I mean, just before that, you got the, you got knocked the fuck out by Ben Flower as well. So it was all a very emotional climax for you. Yeah, like John said, it was. Um, I think the the lockdown was very similar to myself. It was. Um, it made you reevaluate like sport and your life and your lifestyle and, and what's important and. <clears throat> going into last season, I, I had it in the back of my mind that it was going to be my last. Um, I really struggled to get up for a pre-season training. Um, like I had niggling injuries and they were just, yeah, I just lost that little bit of love for the game. I think when you play the same position as, as John and I, you you have to put your body through a lot week in, week out. And, and if you're not 100% committed, um, we just wouldn't be able to perform. And I think during that first lockdown, I had to really work hard uh, to motivate myself to keep in shape, but I always had um, the 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 vision that you know I could finish on a high, whether that be another grand final appearance or, or to challenge a cup, which is um, you know playing at Wembley is something that that's always eluded me, and I think that was just the real motivator for, for the, re, the re, real main motivator for me um, during that time off, and I think I, I pretty much made my mind up then that I couldn't carry on doing it, and. Um, it was it was a different end of the season with no fans there. Um, like, like John said, it you, you kind of ease into it into retirement because you don't have that same buzz on a weekend if you're playing in an empty stadium or you know there's no fans around and it's it's just take the shine off it a little bit. Um, and I, like like you said, I think um, there was a time when my last action in uh, in rugby league as a professional was was going to be knocked the fuck out by Ben Flower off a kick out. Which left me in a groggy state for it for a good week or so, but um, I managed to have a swan song against um, Wakefield away at Headingley, a great it, iconic fixture, uh, and yeah, I've got no regrets and uh, really happy with how things finished up for me. 
Did, did that speed the, up the decision for both of you, do you think, John, as well? That, you know, I mean, I know you didn't really experience much of it, but the playing with no fans, and I know obviously you had your, your issue with your knee and stuff as well, but I mean, it, it, it's a it's pretty... It's pretty. It's a pretty dead thing, as they say, Mark, isn't it? You experienced it playing with with nobody there and still putting your, your body through it. I will say for me though, I, I tried to retire last year. Will like this? I, should, I had no right to be playing rugby this year. I wanted to retire last year. Brian McDermott made time in his day to drive over to where I live, sat down with me, and said, "Right, I want you to play again." Uh, you know, okay, Brian. And, yes, whatever you say, Brian. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll do it again for an inflated <laughs> salary. Yeah, which is what the kid, it was the truth. It's the truth, isn't it? If you want to talk about truth? The reason I carried on playing that year was because the money was good, and you know Brian McDermott, who I respected, asked him asked me, you know, personally to do it for him. So, but it's quite but, scary, isn't it? He is. Yeah, he'd, he'd fill us all. Would he jump off a cliff if he asked you? Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> definitely definitely in the that's mind, a tv show there the somewhere isn't there there's a tv show yeah. will you will you jump off a cliff for brian mcdermott yes <laughs> bye john what channel would that no, be but, on yeah channel five or dave it'd be on dave for sure yeah i'd host if it. you if don't, if you don't dave, show will. it if you don't show it dave yeah. will <laughs> it'll be straight after monkey tennis <laughs> yeah <laughs> now nah, and we make we make so much of retiring right like it's just part of life. Like everything has a start and a finish. Like nothing lasts mm. forever. Like you start somewhere and you finish it. I, I find mm. what I found with me retiring from rugby is it affects people close to you more than it does you. I really was more than comfortable of where my career sat. But the people who, like for example, my mum and dad, like their social life kind of revolved, you know, around coming over to watch the rugby. You know, you probably neglect. I neglected that that was so important to them, but for me, like, mm. it was just not an issue, you know. But we make a big deal of retiring from sport. Well, like people, yeah, you, change. you do. No, I, I get that, but you, at the same time, it's like you you are still both in your thirties, to quote David. Yeah, Blake, but we're not, you know, and we're not, we're not retired though, will are we? We're just changing jobs. I know you're not retired, but I mean, but it feels like kind of. And I go back to the point that this is a routine that you guys have been sort of entrenched in from your teenage years and probably even younger than that, you know, Mark, when you were doing your bits at, at Saddle with Rugby Club as a little boy, you know, it's always been... Yes, yeah, it's, it's a know, big part of each of our identity. And a lot of rugby players and sports people, they, they, it, their sport and their job for that period of time defines them. I think um, I think I felt quite good these last few years having had other facets to my life, whether that be the coffee shop or family. I think I've got... I've probably become more rounded as an individual and less focused on sport, which meant that this transition has been a lot easier because I've I've got I've got more things to, to spend my time and enjoy rather than just train, play, train, play, twenty four seven because it, it does completely uh, yeah. take over your life. And sport's got a responsibility, right? A sport needs an uppercut in some senses because you you know we preach all this stuff about you know how focused you've got to be to do well, and 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 for the guys who make it to the to the upper echelons, the very, very best in the world at what they do, it kind of works. But for everyone else, it's nonsense. Did you ever go, right, my life is all about work. That's it. And, and and in any other walk of life, any mantra, you read the Tao, you read any sort of historical documents about how to live your life, it's about balance. And and sport inherently puts your life out of balance. And, and sport needs to really understand the negative connotations of, of making young people feel like they have to commit every single ounce of themselves to something without having other interests. It's mental. Well, that's a selfishness from clubs and coaches that they just want players just to completely immerse themselves in the sport just to get the best out of them. There's, that's a selfishness, I think, I think and probably um, it's up to athletes and players to be, to be stronger and probably think more about how they spend the time. But I think it's easier said than done. Yeah. And and they have to do that for themselves, Flash, right? You know what I mean? I, I think there's a big culture in sport where it's like give and take. You know, everything's put on a platter for you. You just take it. Um, well, you need to be resilient enough to deal with shit in your life. Like, things go wrong all the time in your life. Like, it, unless you're like a miracle, like some adversity will come across your doorstep. And it'll come across your doorstep, like maybe... 30, 40 times in your life. And what we have to, I think the sport world in general, should focus on building resilient people, not not 
just proficient and competent sports people because we need to be resilient to deal with like the, the stuff that goes on like this last year do you know what one thing i learned about myself is i'm pretty chilled with stuff you know i'm too chilled with stuff but i think like people around you are looking for you know for cracks or for the for you to be upset or to 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 be emotional about it but i think you know i think one thing if i could tell a younger athlete anything is to make yourself resilient where sport can't hurt you you know it can't hurt you anymore and it's it's like a powerful thing once you get to that point opinions but, can't hurt you no that's in, uh, that is interesting but you as you always do john you strip kind of the emotion out of things and um i mean look for example what the point i'm trying to get to is surely sportsmen and women romanticize how things end you know they want that yeah. kind of they want that final curtain closed and maybe that's just the ego talking, but it often doesn't work out like that, does it? And especially people like, you know, you guys deserved an ending. Flash had a, had an ending to a certain degree with that. Yeah, no, I, I don't agree fun. with that because every yeah. single match, there's, there's, there's a narrative, there's a story that can be told. Well, take, take for instance, the grand final. So Wigan played against Saints, two iconic players for each team, Sean O'Loughlin and James Graham. Like, the, you're not telling me one of, one of them, James Graham, was meant to win that game. Because the same could be said for Sean O'Loughlin. Every single player on that field has got his own story to tell. And it's just a coincidence that it might happen in your last game. I, I don't believe in, in that kind of um that that romantic ending that, that it's just it's just a coincidence for, for me. Yeah, for sure. And like do did I right, you've got to put yourself, Will, in like a seventeen year old lad shoes turning up at St. Helens. Did I ever even consider like a romantic end to my career? It was all about like youthful ambition and just being like overwhelmed by this opportunity that I've got. And like, I think for then 10, 15 years down the line to go, right, well, look, I've just want like a romantic send off now. I don't, I, I just don't know anybody who thinks like that. It can happen like Flash said, but it's largely down to coincidence and timing. It's not, like I'm sat at home and in five years time, I'm going to be, you know, sinking a Guinness and think, God, if only I'd have got clapped off at Old Trafford in my last game, that would have, <laughs> you know what I mean? That would have made Drinking it worth Drinking a Guinness disguised as water. It is water. You changed. Oh, sorry. Clear, oh, no. sorry. It, clear, it clearly <laughs> says water on it. <laughs> sorry, man. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, look, I mean, it can it can be a a dark time for people, and you guys have got your shit together. You've got your head screwed on. You've got your families and your misses, and you know, and you must have seen people around you in the same sort of situation. Who it's it is very difficult for because it's unknown territory, and you could just say, okay, well, look, you've got to plan ahead, and you have been. I mean, look, you both were you, you both knew what life you were going to go into four or five years ago. For for some other people, it's not quite as simple as that, and you can imagine it's it's quite a troublesome time. But they'd, they'd struggle in yeah. any walk of life, wouldn't they? It's not like a unique problem with sport. That the, the, the people who aren't prepared for adversity in any walk of life struggle. And, and people struggle for loads of reasons, like emotionally. The, the one thing I hate when I hear um, a past player talk about their time in the game is how much they miss the changing room. I miss the lads. I miss the changing room. And, I, and it makes me sad because I think... Like, if you've not got those relationships in your life that don't revolve around your work, like in any other walk of life, that would be really unproductive to just be completely immersed socially, everything in your work. It's, a, it's, then, not, a, it's not a nine to five job, though, is it? You can, they're two quite distinct, yeah. distinctly opposite kind of vocations that nine to five job in an office, for instance, and a sport where you're around each other six, seven days a week and you probably go through a lot emotionally, physically together. There is more yeah. of an attachment to your teammates and your colleagues. The def definite, definitely, definitely. I, I completely agree with that. But that's maybe where then the sport needs to look at addressing that. Is is that healthy? Is it is it is it really sustainable beyond your thirties to to live in that way? Well, look, you know, I'm all for team spirit, and I, I loved you know teams that I played in and players that I played with. But the reality is, when you finish, like what you. You know, there'll be lads, there'll be somebody listening to this who, you know, you've got maybe four or five guys who you play with, who you speak to and you finish. Do you know, unless you're one of those narcissistic guys who's in nine million WhatsApp groups who just keeps communicating because he's petrified of being alone. 
Which way are we pointing? Is that right? Or I just chased, I just chased after you've <laughs> jumped for affection and I don't get it. No. <laughs> All right, John. So, what do, what do yeah. you miss? What do you miss from it? Because there must be something that you have that is, has been taken out of violence. that lifestyle, out of that routine. Violent, violence. Violence. Yeah. Honestly, go on, elaborate. Yeah. Well, sports oh, violence. Like, rub- big hard rub- John Wilkin misses the no, violence. No, but no, no, but it is. You miss. <laughs> I miss. I miss the contact and physical stuff and and competing and being aggressive. Like it's not something you can just walk down to like your supermarket and just like. <laughs> bomb someone out the way is it it's like it's a yeah, part of your life fighting it's to a, replace it's a, it yeah but it's a part of your life I'd love never to see you back. in the octagon absolutely yeah I'd just I'd, what uh, would be your yeah, entrance I'd, music um, Bruce Springsteen dancing in the dark um, what would be your song well, that I, would be the name John, John the Whopper Wilkin yeah John the Melted Welly Wilkin I think that's more probably more <laughs> I'll, I'll just call myself Ian Beale <laughs> Um, no but no but you're serious you do miss that and that so that is something already we've tapped into something yeah no no but i think if you play rugby you are you you know you're attracted to that the the that that element of your character like flash flash i've never known a player hit harder than flash um and he doesn't do that like there's an element there has to be violence behind that and we want to we want to portray like rugby league as a, as a family sport, which it is because it's enjoyed by families, and I get that. But what underpins what's attractive about our sport is the violence, and that's what people like. And is violence the, the word though, is it, or is it? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, what's the most Contact, watched clip yeah. of rugby league ever? Ben Flower, but that aggression. doesn't happen every game. No, it doesn't happen every game, but people are attracted to violence. It's in our human nature. We're like, why do people slow down for a car crash? Like, it's yeah, the same. Yeah, I know that, but I don't miss the violence point. because I never did that, but I'm, I never no, but punched you did. someone in the in. You did. You hit people and stood but over I wouldn't, them. I wouldn't, call that, I wouldn't call that violent. I only did that to you when I knocked you out. So technique isn't violent. <laughs> so your technique it's isn't violent. Aggression. No, but your technique isn't violent. Today. Yeah, but it's violent. Oh, it has to be. Yeah. But do, right. do, yeah, you, but do you both think just, how, how you think and how, but, how yeah, you, you reminisce you about the game? That. Yeah, but well, like, so so you, we're obviously talking, it's still reasonably raw in terms of time, isn't it? I mean, what are we? We're, we're in February and yeah. you guys sort of called it quits at the end of last season. John, you just sort of fizzled out. I don't know when you, when, when was the end for you? When, when were we like putting the Wikipedia squib. that you finished? 2008. <laughs> 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 and and how you're feeling now might be very different you know in in three or four yeah. years when you know it's it really yeah. has gone and really is a thing of the past john yeah, will be starting that... whatsapp groups with all his old mates yeah, hey, yeah, do you remember exactly, that time yeah. when uh went but, to the pub I, funny um I, I wrote an article uh for the time for the times i i like a columnist for the times back in like 2009 or 10 and i wrote an article and i was like in that article, I said something like, um, said, oh, I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to be one of those players that sort of hangs around, you know, long past the sort of, you know, time. And and I think I said as well, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to retire, you know, when I'm 30, 31, 32. You know, that is what you say at, at a certain point in time. And, you know, I, I think if you all, we all reflect back on things that we say, you know, back in the day, I don't, I don't think we really always act in the way that we say back, you know, back then. I, you know, I, I was romantic about finishing at Saints, about winning something. But if we look at really probably the deep story behind my career, the reason I kept playing is because I was chasing things at Saints. I was really successful as a young guy in 2006, won everything, 2007, 8, 9, very successful you know, uh, started in the Four Nations final for, for England in 2011. So, you know, and, and after that, really, that's when I was probably chasing success, uh, you know, and the time at St. Helens, maybe the squad and all of it aligned that it wasn't meant to be. But that, you know, I think so when you say cre- chasing success, is that is that like, and I mentioned the word ego, and I mean that, you know, in in the sort of dictionary definition way rather than how we interpret it. But that, that essentially is what's driving that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. It was dopamine. Well, the, yeah, it? I like, think it... E- ego, pride, ambition are all kind of rolled into one, aren't they? And I think all, anyone who plays professional sport, has, there's a bit of ego there, a bit of pride. 
and a bit of ambition to be the best person they can be and uh, and, and beat opposition. And I think that's probably something that John's had and, and I've probably been, been guilty of, you might say. Yeah, and I think one thing is that people might not understand is, is when so we played at Saints and we played at big clubs and, and when you play at a big club, if you don't win that last game of the season, you're pretty much disappointed for four months. Do you know what I mean? It's not like... It's not something that just goes away overnight. Like that's a four month like period of disappointment. So when I say I was chasing success, I was probably chasing that last day of the season just to feel, you know, re- relieved, rewarded. You know, um, so when I, it, the point of why I brought that up is when I reflected back to something I'd said a long time ago, and I realised I probably contradicted myself and 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 not lived what I'd said, but. I just find it interesting that once you get into like a narrative of your life and you can get carried away chasing something and 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 it's probably what I it's probably what I did for a number of years. Well, I suppose that in 2009 you you'd be quite naive to to predict what you'd think when you're 32 33, you know. You, yeah, yeah, you probably sure, thought, yeah, yeah. thought that you 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 wouldn't want to have that same ambition, that same drive to win stuff, but it it still burns and it still burned for me and, until I until I realized I couldn't do it anymore. Yeah, and you well, I mean, that. John, we were, we were saying before, weren't we? Mark announced his retirement um, six months before <laughs> retiring. It was, uh, yeah, there was a, a press release. It was a pitch. It was a pitch side Sky Sports interview that I've yeah. that I, that I, and I was like, "What's this?" Flash is just talking. He's like, "He's, he's retired." He's, I was like, "My God, why would he not tell me that he's never? That's his last game ever." So I was watching this interview unfold, and I was thinking, "Mark, why he's retired? Why is he retired now? Was he injured?" No, he's retiring in six months' time. Well, which... what happened there, John? If you just give me a second to explain. Earlier that week, I had a, um, a very candid discussion with Ian Watson about my playing career and what I wanted to do. And it, it was at that point that I told him uh, my intention to retire at, at the end of that season. Um, that Friday, we played on Sky. I think it might have been against Leeds. And just before the game, he told me, so by the way, I've, I've spoke to the guys at Sky and I've told them that you're retiring and, and they want to do have a quick interview with you after the game. Is that all right? That's, is so, that, that's nice so, of him. <laughs> that's nice of him, yeah. So I was like, uh, yeah, cool, no worries. Anyway, game finished. I thought, shall I do this, shall I not? We'd lost the game. And then I thought, what would John Wilkin do? And I thought, I should probably take a leaf out of his book and you know, crave some attention, get, get on the microphone, <laughs> get on the camera and just talk for a few minutes about myself. And it felt really good, well actually. It was good. Well done. Yeah. Well it done. was good. I did enjoy it. I did enjoy it. And you tried to get yourself a job at Sky Sports in that same interview, didn't you? Which was nice. Yeah. I, I gave the coffee shop a plug. Yeah, it was, it was good. You did. You did. Yeah, there's been a few yeah. plugs to that coffee shop. Um, mm. Oi, so in terms of consulting with the family and, you know, no, like John, you just said at the beginning there that you you sort of, you know, you, you tried to retire last season anyway, because obviously mm. injury, um, the whole situation at Toronto, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, and other things come into play. But then how much do you have to sit down? For example, Mark, with the missus, you know, parents, family, is it how, how do you make the decision? And and because it wasn't necessarily your body telling you it was time, was it? A little bit. There was there was niggling injuries that I could I could feel every day at training, but um it was more the the will and the want to carry on playing. Um but it was my decision. It was completely my decision. Um and I think any player or athlete that says that they play for the family or play for them, um, for the kids or the parents or whatever. I think that's bullshit because if I didn't want to play, but my mum and dad, my mum and dad wouldn't want me to play if it was for them. I, I I played rugby as a small child because I loved it. I was competitive, and that drove me through from five years of age to thirty three. And it was that same motivation every day to, to to when I finished. But that was for nobody else. That was because I loved playing. I wanted to win. And I made a career out of it. My wife, my son, mum and dad, they they would not want me to play if it wasn't solely for myself. And um, it's selfish, I suppose, but that's that's why we do things we love, uh, whether it's sport or, or whatever. So you lose you lose a hunger almost, and you know is what you're saying. You, you've you've achieved everything. There's nowhere else you can go with it. You just think I've you know I've I've had enough of this. Nah, a little bit. I, yeah, but I I also think hunger is like an interesting like concepts like you're hungry to to compete you know if you're competitive you you're always hungry to compete aren't you um 
you know, I don't, I don't necessarily think that you, you lose hunger for the game. What, what you lose hunger for is the days that people don't see you doing your job. You know, those, those days where you're not on show. So, you know, a Monday morning, the back end of my career was tough, you know, where you, you, you're still sore and you, you're having to train and go through contacts and stuff like that. And, that sort of stuff can 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 grind you down in time, but I, I don't think you can become less hungry. I just think you mature. Your hunger becomes less emotional and more rational. Like that's life. You know, you grow up. You know, when you're young, you want to do everything. I want to win. I want to. You know, I'm gonna just do everything. And then as you get older, you become more rational. And maybe that's the sad part about life, but it's also realistic, isn't it? You know, you know, you're much more self-aware. I was so much more self-aware in my 30s than I was in my 20s. You know, you don't really, I think that's something that comes to you with time. And uh, certainly for men, you know, I think we're, you know, self-awareness and learning and, and development of our own selves. I think we get into our 30s and 40s, you know, before we really, things start to all fall into place. And that, that's how I found it anyway. I certainly don't think in my 20s, I, I had the mental capacity to deal with being self-aware enough, you know. I mean, you, you had a different ending, John, because, um, you know, you, you kind of, I mean, you could have retired, couldn't you, straight after St. Helens? And that almost would have been, I know you're inter not interested in those romantic endings, but you took on a, another adventure and and it did put a strain on you. You know, you were living other side of the, of the world for uh, large parts. You were away from uh, Fran. And look, I, you've been open about it. I've read articles with you say it, you know, you were sort of trying for a baby and it put a strain on your marriage. It was, it wasn't straightforward. It was, it wasn't plain sailing for you. No, it's hard. I think jog, uh, geography is an interesting thing is you take for granted the space between you and people, you know, what it means. And, um, you know, I made a decision to go out there and, and, and look, my wife, like uh, she is ultimately, like probably more driven than I, I, I am, you know, she's more driven than, than anybody really I've ever met in, in some ways and, 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 and stubborn with it as well. And, and, and me being away and, you know, it was just, it was a very challenging time in, in, in a lot of ways, but, but also like hugely enjoyable time as well. Like, uh, you know, the negativity to surrounding Toronto was, was, was based very loosely on the fact that we have like an insular echo chamber of a game that is is obsessed with repeating history, that that's kind of one of the the issues. Me being out there was was tough, but only because the geography of it was you know it was a tough situation. The the rugby side of it, living in Toronto, like if you guys could have got out to that city, like I I just know rugby league fans would have fallen in love with it, and it's just a real shame it finished like. You know, like it did. And as you said, I could have retired at the end of St. Helens. But the reality of it is Toronto offered me way too much money to keep playing. And that's yeah. that's that was it. You it know, Brian I was like, I like you it. into it. Well, it wasn't, it was Brian, Brian, I think Brian Noble. I think the contract negotiation went like this. I want this. He's like, uh, yeah, all right. I was like, really? Okay. Yeah, I'll do it. <laughs> all the Brian's. Look, so go, go on, you say you say it wouldn't have ended the way that it did. How how has it ended? How did it end for Toronto? Is it the end? Yeah, it, it's the end, isn't it? You can't, you can't, you can't kick them out of the competition. Put Lee Centurions in, and then claim to have a, an idea that you want an expansionist franchise in North America. Hmm. The, I mean, it, there might be sense behind it. You know, there's people there. You know, I've got utmost respect for Lee, and you know it. Well done to them for getting in. I think it's great for Lee. Fantastic history and heritage with the game. Uh, it's more of an overarching concern with where we go from here, you know. And and the you know the the the, the expansionist sort of chat, you know. I, I'm bored of it anyway. I'm bored of talking about yeah. it because well, we, like, we they, talked about that forever and ever, haven't we? Yeah. So look, guys, on the subject of resigning, retiring, Robert Elston, who we all like very much uh, as a guy and we've had on the podcast before and we were there, weren't we, right at the beginning when he first got the job and he talked about all the sort of dreams and ambitions and the TV deal, et cetera, et cetera. And hopefully we're going to get him on the podcast um, as well. But he's announced his um, retirement. He's handed in his resignation. John, what did you make of that news? Yeah, I think, look, initially, when he first got that job, I think we all had a chat with him about how 
tough a job it is to get so many free-willed, strong-willed people to align their visions in a way that would would allow him to get the job done. And you know, it's you, you've put into that mix uh, a global pandemic, uh, no live sport in it for the best part of a year. I think Robert's job was 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 nearly impossible, wasn't it? And and and. You know, to I think he was so adamant at the start about the elevation of that TV deal, and although putting other things in play to sort of maybe, you know, keep the clubs happy with the financial state of the game, he, he felt like it was time to step away. But uh, it'd be interesting, would not it, to speak to him? You know, only he knows mm-hmm. the answers, really. Yeah, there's not. I don't. Think there's let- too much that can be said. That can be said right now because you know he's, he's still still employed by Super League. I don't think. Uh, much has come out in the wash, but I think um, it's probably more of a question of the corporate governance of, of Super League and how it's run at the top. Um, I think having every club having its, having a vote and having a say in the game, there's always going to be fractions, there's always going to be different agendas, different ways that clubs want to go. And um, I think when you know when pandemics like COVID and, and other big issues can affect sport and and society, um, you know. Clubs are going to have to look after, invariably look after their own best interests, and um, is is that the, the truest um, way in which the, the sport can grow? If, if if smaller clubs are looking after themselves, or or bigger clubs are, are wanting, you know, that their own interests at heart. So I think it's more corporate governance is is, is what needs to be looked at because um, I, I I get the impression it's a pretty impossible job that Roberts had to do these last few years, and whoever gets it next is. Is is going to be in for a tough task? But it's always been it's always been really tough. That that that's one thing that rugby league has, has struggled with is joined up sort of thinking, you know, at the top of the clubs and at the top of the game. You know, connecting the governing body with the clubs and the, the visions of the clubs has always been it's been a huge challenge. And I just feel like. That that's still the case now, and 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 will it always be the case? We we just don't know. But but Robert, you know, came with so much energy and enthusiasm and and, and vigor, and he sounded, you know, like you know he was the man to get things done. And it's sad that he, he's had to step away. And that's the one thing you can't take away from him. You know, we we've sat there and seen it in his eyes, and it's not just some sort of politician story when he first got the job. You know, he used to stand on the terraces at Cass when he was a kid. It's in his blood. You know, he didn't, he, there were other jobs he could have taken. Let's put it that way. You know, he was at Everton. He could have gone to another football club, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll be fascinating to speak to him in, in that sense. But it was, there was a massive roadblock. And I'm sure he will say just when COVID came and the impact of COVID, because up until that point, John, things were ticking along quite nicely. And obviously negotiations, which he'll get into with TV deals, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, look, I mean, nobody can predict. The only predictable thing about COVID is people are losing their jobs. <laughs> like in, in any walk of life, in all walks of life, that, that's a fact. And industries that rely upon, you know, people for uh, revenue and attendances and, you know, it, it, it's just crippled everybody. And, um, you know, rugby league's no different to that. It was rugby league robust anyway to sort of ride it out and deal with it? I, I don't think it was probably in the best shape going in, but there's a lot of other team sports that are in a, in this bigger pickle as as rugby league. But I just I said this before and I'll say it again: the game needs a period of just harmony of of just drive in the same direction. And I, I don't really care what direction that is. I just think we need to shelve self interest, which Flash alluded to there. One of the biggest challenges in the sport is 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 uh, that protectionist sort of mentality of looking after your own ends, and that's that's life to a point. But we need something that cuts through all of that, and and uh, you know who knows where that comes from, you know. And look, Mark, this is off the back, isn't it, of what was an incredible grand final? I mean, Makinson's drop goal on the hooter, off the post, touchdown by Jack Wells being the most dramatic of, of finishes. It was magical. It was scarcely believable, wasn't it, at the time? And the perfect way to to showcase a sport. Yeah, I thought it was it was quite apt that um, a player like that won the match because um, it was ferocious, it was um, constant, it was just end to end for the full match, and um, it, neither team managed to break the other one down properly. 
and it was all about hard work and effort and it was a, an unbelievable effort from a young man that um, probably does that all the time in training and then the one the one time out of 100 that he does it in a game or in training, he, he, he gets his rewards and um, yeah, I thought it was an unbelievable match. Um, some of the efforts James Bentley made over 70 tackles, I think James Roby was unbelievable. I just thought that, you know, that it was a battle of attrition and um, the way that both teams just stood up and defended and just kept hanging in there for each other. Uh, it, it was an unbelievable game and uh, full credit yeah. to Saints, but full credit to Wigan as well because it really could have gone either way. Yeah, and that game, right, for me, reframes what we think of rugby in this country because if we're critical of ourselves, I'd say we're never seen as being a competition that's built on on like defensive uh, efficiency and 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 defending well, we're, 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 the competition is seen as probably more reckless, a bit more flighty than the NRL. And I thought in 80 minutes of that game, you saw one of the most entertaining games that we've ever seen in the history of Super League. It, it may be the it might be the most entertaining game of rugby I've seen. Full stop. And there was relatively few opportunities to score. It wasn't built around flamboyant attacking play. It was like just gritty, tough, entertaining stuff. And the finish was just magic. It was a magical moment. I was lucky enough to be there and it was just a magical moment. As disappointing as it was for Wigan, you know, what a game. And if you're going to build anything off, off any game this year, build it off that because it was an incredible sports match and, and something that is just so sad there was nobody there to see it you know if the, if that had been in a packed old Trafford it would have it would have been a, a ridiculous scene at the end but there's something quite apt 2020 the year that everything stopped that Jack Wells be a 19 year old kid turned around to celebrate and he didn't celebrate to the crowd he ran back and celebrated with his team and I thought it was quite apt you know for the year to finish like that. Yeah. Look, uh, we'll finish off then with uh, question time. Question time. Question Remember time. that. It's back. Good Don't worry about that. Uh, and you can always get your questions into out of your RL uh, on Twitter, which is the handle. I uh, use the hashtag out of your league. Starting with a nice, look, very serious one to kick things off. DJ Neil oh, Scotland has been in touch. Who, uh, when you click on is his he a, uh, profile. Is he a real DJ? Is he a DJ? He is, he like, well, he says he's is he a like Dr. Fox? Professional house music DJ and he's available for bookings, oh. Mark. He's um, yeah, <laughs> scotland.n at yahoo.com. I think he'd be happy to get that out there. That's on his profile. He, uh, this is very serious. Look, in your opinion, who's made the best moves in the off-season in terms of signings and coaches' changes? That's one for you, Mark. Um, the, the player I'm looking forward to seeing more than anybody is Greg Inglis. Um, I, th- I think over the last probably 15 years, he's been the best outside back uh, around the world and probably one of the best of all time. Um, he's had a season off uh, from playing, so it'd be interesting to see what kind of shape he'll be in because I think he's one of those fellas that can put weight on quite easily. But uh, if he fires, Warrington have got an unbelievable player and, um, like I said, a, a modern-day great. And in terms of coaching, I'd like to see how um, Brett Hodgson gets on at Hull. Um, he was a very intelligent player when he played at, at Huddersfield and Warrington. What a man of steel. Um, I've, I've been led to believe that he, he did some great things at West Tigers as the assistant coach there. He's got a lot of talented players at Hull um, to probably just guide in the right direction. And I think he'll be really interesting, interesting to see how he gets on. Yeah. yeah I think Wigan, Wigan, that, well, yeah, Wigan for me, because you know Wigan went to the grand final last year and they were incredible all year. And then they just keep adding to the squad without losing anybody. You know, you expected Jackson Hastings to leave, Thomas Luloi to finish. They've carried on going. They've brought new players in alongside that. And plus, I think they've got maybe 10 or 12 young guys who are just going to be better this year again. So for me, Wigan are, 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 you know, one of the most exciting teams in the competition. But, you know, bear in mind, I didn't really fancy them last year and they, they went all the way and were fantastic all all year and, and they've just added to that so I, I think Adrian Lamb another year as coach as well will really have his, his, his stamp on the team so yeah look out for, for Wigan and uh, I'll be making a booking uh, for the DJ yes I'll get him down. <laughs> he's available for booking I'll get him down um, oh look James St. Latic is back remember Ian as we used to call him uh, oh, from Cleethorpe and he says look now John is retired <laughs> 
Can you discuss who is the biggest cat in rugby league? <laughs> <laughs> um, what biggest a biggest feline in rugby league? <laughs> I don't know. Read maybe into that he what should. You will. Maybe he should contribute. If you know, he's, he's, he's yeah. Maybe give you three hundred... to pick from. Yeah, yeah. Come on, mate. Come on. You you tell us who you think, rather than us uh, throw Mark Flanagan under the bus or myself. Okay. Um, well, let's throw Mark Flanagan under the bus with this one. Willis has been in touch. He said, the most excited I've ever been was on the morning of my seventh birthday. I was so thrilled with my Knight Rider bike that I forgot to put underpants on and got laughed at by the rest of the class when I dropped my shorts to get changed for PE. Space. Question. What's the most excited you've ever been, Mark? Um, it's a good question. Um, <laughs> my, wed- my wedding day? No. Nah. Uh, well, that's <laughs> no. answer. Uh, when I was a kid, I was I had a, I had a mad, um, really intense um, love for Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and I was banned from watching it by my mother because I used to hyperventilate and get so excited. So probably that. <laughs> <laughs> hyperventilate. Come on, uh, no. Wilkin, anything yeah. to add? Well, that, my, mine's not really a story about excitement, but it was along the same lines of the embarrassment that this guy yeah. sort of felt at school. Um, I was 11 years old. I was carrying a tray full of drinks back to Fenner's Rugby Club, which is like a junior rugby club. Uh, and for people who didn't know, it was a full glass-fronted, um, it was like a, a cabin, really, but it was all glass-fronted. And to get in, you have to press a buzzer. I pressed the buzzer. When the buzzer went, everyone in the bar turns around. And a guy who I played with, for under 12s East Hull. Uh, what was it called? Drop Jamie Boville dropped my pants um, and essentially a bar full of 100 people stood and looked at me, but I couldn't do anything. I just had to stand there uh, with my pants around my ankles for what felt like maybe 15 minutes. Oh, uh, quite so a feel- down there as well, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly not one of my strengths, Mark. You know, girth and length. Uh, it's like a, not, a, a, a mini pepperoni, you know those ones that you unwrap. I've seen, yeah, on yeah. Many occasions. I, I, well, I was like thinking more bit. like uh, M and S, you know, M and S cocktail sausage, one of those. Yes. You know where it's it's dried and like it's a got like a bit of stuff, a congealed fat around the outside, and it doesn't look very yeah. appetising, but it tastes great. <laughs> oh, these are the things that question time bring up. It's really, uh, I've really missed it. Um, this one here from um, Alex Heron. He says, uh, does professional rugby league have a future in North America for John? Will amateur youth rugby league be back this year? And if not, how damaging will that be for the sport for Mark? Cheers. Um, no. <laughs> no, straight up, no. Will, will we'll be back. No. Okay. Mark? Yes, for junior rugby, we'll be back. Yeah, we'll be back. So well, no, yes, no, no, no. Can I, can I, can I expand on the no? Why, yes. why would yes. anybody with money put money into a franchise in North America when the game has said there is no future for the game over there? It's meant, it's mental. It would be mental to put money into a franchise in America, wouldn't it? Yeah. Okay, uh, look, this one, uh, this one, you might need to elaborate on Peter Harvey, who's a former St Helens player. Um, says that uh, I will talk to those two any time without any contractual arrangements, even by a round in brackets. Sorry, John, I will remember, but no doubt my book will be mentioned too. Any thoughts on that from Peter Harvey? Pete, Peter Harvey was a school teacher, former player for St. Helens, and is shamelessly trying to sell more copies of his book. Well, that's what he's doing. <laughs> so, we plugged a good book, we plugged a DJ, yeah. It's uh, it's just a book of St. Helens abbreviations that he's learned over the years. Um, just little <laughs> yeah. little sayings from the town. Is no, it not, Bravo 2-0 by Andy McDab? It Which gets better with every read. It does. And look, this is a way to finish then this week. Uh, the more obscure questions, the better. And this one from Dan Heyman, who I remember used to send us in a few questions quite a few years ago. Uh, if there's no oxygen in space, how does the sun burn? And finally, what's the best thing? In capital letters. Sliced bread, isn't it? Yeah. It's the best thing. That's, yeah, it is, yeah. Mark, have you got anything to add on the oxygen in space? Don't know what the, the answer is sliced bread, yeah. 
Don't know. We'll look into it. We'll get back to you next week on that one, Dan. Thank you very much. Um, Right, guys, enjoyed that. We are back. Thank you very much for listening to Out of Your League. We'll have a, a new episode for you every week available to download from wherever you get your podcasts. Big guests, big topics. Uh, all coming your way over the next few weeks in the course of the season. Remember, you can download all the episodes uh, from wherever you get those podcasts, whether it's Apple, whether it's Spotify. And you can also watch us on YouTube. We'll see you next time. Be seeing you.